Welcome to Age Hackers, powered by Gladden Longevity with Dr. Jeffrey Gladden, where our passion is to help you live young for a lifetime. On this show, we want to help you optimize your longevity, health, and human performance with impactful and actionable information by answering three questions. How good can we be? How do we make 100 the new 30? And how do we live well beyond 120? I'm Steve Ryder and Dr. Gladden, we just wrapped up with Dr. Anthony Balduzzi. And he is a naturopathic doctor in Arizona, and he has the Fit Father Project and the Fit Mother Project. And so we talked mm-hmm. about family fitness. We talked about how to make systemic change. We talked in and in one and at one point in the podcast, he turned the tables and talked about how he wanted to be you when he grew up. Yeah, that was quite <laughs> interesting, wasn't it? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with Anthony. I think the audience is going to as well. He's a He's a very, very sharp guy who has made some significant strides and helped a lot of people, families, but he's kind of focused it into helping the fathers and then helping the mothers really kind of come to grips with life itself, right? And how they frame up health and longevity and how they transfer to their kids and how they create their own routines. But it goes well beyond that. There's so much more that we go into beyond that around his own journey and lots of really cool insights about how to really activate longevity for each of us. I I love this conversation. So it's cool. Welcome everybody to this edition of the Age Hackers podcast powered by Gladden Longevity. I'm your host, Dr. Jeffrey Gladden. And Steve Ryder is with me here today. Steve, it's good to see you again. Good Um, to see you too, my man. Yeah. You know, I just got back from RadFest. How was it? Gave a couple of talks there. Yeah, it was great. It was actually terrific. The talks were incredibly well received. I, the first talk I gave was on basically the hero's journey of reclaiming our birthright to live young for a lifetime. And it was a really well received talk. So we'll either have to reprise that or get out a copy of that to the audience. I think they'll enjoy that. There were a couple of other big moments. One is we, um, you know, we just recently launched the book 100 is the New 30. And we had a book signing there. So that was fun. And then we officially launched our two uh, new hydrogen products, the H2 Chill and the H2 Energy. And so those were well received also. So that's, uh, so that was fun. So yeah, so lots for, happened since the last time I saw you. And for listeners who are interested in that H2 Chill and H2 Energy, you can use the code PODCAST10 and get 10% off of that order. Nice. Yeah, I think you'll, I think you'll love it. You know, when we were doing all the testing on this, the people that wrestle with a bit of anxiety or stress or things like that. They just love the chill, right? I mean, the hydrogen in general resets your brain, but then this kind of adds in an element of calmness. And then I love to use the energy pre-workout, pre-mountain bike ride, you know, later in the afternoon when your brain started fatigue, it works great, really, really great. So uh, people can try that and let us know what you think. We'll We'll be happy to hear your feedback on it. So good. Well, Steve, we have an interesting guest with us today. That we do. Yeah. That we do, Dr. Anthony Balduzzi. Actually, did, that's, that's a name that rolls off my tongue. <laughs> did, 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 did I say it right? It works. I mean, depends on how Italian you want to get. Like, you can get the Balduzzi. Anthony, Anthony Balduzzi if you want Balduzzi. to. Balduzzi. Yeah. Balduzzi. When I lived in the East Coast, I got a little more of that. In Arizona, you know, I'm Balduzzi. <laughs> that's right. Balduzzi. I like it. Good. So, Anthony. Yeah, welcome to the show. So tell us a little bit about this project you've been working on, this Fit Father, Fit Mother project. I'm I'm curious about the project, but I'm also curious a little bit about how you got into this. And maybe you could share with the audience a little bit of your history, some things that happened to you in your childhood that kind of shaped your your trajectory, so to speak. 100%. You know, so what I do today with Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project is help dads and moms over 40 reach a goal weight, get to optimal weight, improve their health, their strength, their lifespan, and really create a culture of health for their families. And growing up, I had no idea I was going to get into this. I had a pretty standard average childhood. I was born in Syracuse, New York, and split time Mm -hmm. between there and Toronto, Canada. And I love being outside, playing with my little brother, getting into all the sports. I was a pretty good student. What was unique Mm -hmm. about my childhood, though, is I I was able to witness firsthand what happens when you lose your health, because I saw my dad basically lose his. And he lost it because he busted his butt to do what many parents want to do, which is provide for their families. And Mm -hmm. his health routines got put on the back burner. And he got a cancer diagnosis when he was in his late 30s. And he ended up dying when he was 42. 
So oh, I was, tragic. What's the cancer? Was it? He had a glioblastoma is the kind okay. of cancer he had. And yeah. I was nine years old when I saw all that go down Well, when he officially wow. passed. But in years mm. prior to that, I mean, I got to see what it was like to have one of your parents, someone you look up to is maybe even seeming immortal, right? I saw mm. him deteriorate before my eyes, you know, between all mm. the, all the surgeries, the cancer, uh, the radiation, the chemo, you know, and eventually he, you know, he died in the home we were living in, like in his bedroom. And it right. rocked my world, as you can imagine. Um, it made me get really deep from a young age. And also I'm the oldest son of the family, you know, it, mm. it got me thinking a lot, like what's going to happen to us. You know, I felt like I needed to step up a little bit. And I also had so much pain that I didn't know what to do with. What was yeah. pretty fortunate in the silver lining was my mom did gift me a pair of my dad's old dumbbells. And this was around my 10th birthday. And not that okay. I knew how to exercise, but, you know, intuitively, I just started to like use them, do my curls, mm -hmm. do some push ups, and I'd hide them underneath my bed and pull out my little Walkman and listen to some music that got me pumped up and started to exercise. And what I found is, as I started to train, I started to feel better. I just remember like mm -hmm. running at night mm -hmm. until my lungs burned and afterwards I wasn't as sad. And I started to like okay. get stronger and I, I was just kind of taking back control of, of things. So this is interesting. This is really, really interesting. So there's a couple of things here. One is, you know, childhood trauma and, mm -hmm. and all of us have had it, not your particular story, but things have happened to each of us. Right. And I'm just curious, you know, you um, you have a degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. Did you get any psychology help at that point in time through any kind of family counseling or something mm -hmm. with the, the church or the school or anything like that? Or were you pretty much just on your own to try to figure this out? I was in a really good school at the time and I had mm -hmm. a lot of great, honestly, like there were some male figures in my life that were like, like mentors and, and teachers that kind of like stepped up and I, I filled in a number of roles, but okay. it was kind of me on my own, you know, at mm -hmm. this time, like my mom was another caretaker, but I mean, imagine just being a widow with her, sure. you know, in the late, late sure. just trying to take care of the kids. So I think my right. mom and I helped each other heal to a certain extent, but I didn't get psychological counseling. But I guess like in a way, exercise kind of became a way that yeah. I was able to heal right. myself and shift my shift my chemistry. And and, right. and I, I got serious when I was very young. You know, I think by well, by my 11th birthday, I realized that I love this fitness stuff so much. It was helping me feel better. Mm -hmm. And I just like started to get addicted. You know, I, I started studying nutrition. I stopped eating my birthday cake, which I thought that was a good idea at the time, you know, to get really into everything. And, you know, it was like my last birthday okay. cake I had for a, basically a decade at that point. And um, yeah. when I got into high school, I was I had the benefit and the curse, I suppose you could say, of going to an all boys Catholic high school. The benefit mm -hmm. was, you know, there was no girls and the curse was there was no girls. But the benefit of that was that, you know, the yeah, guys got that right on both counts. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So the benefit, you know, part of that was it was it was cool to be strong. And so I was packing my meals, taking my gallon of water. I wrestled and I was starting to get strong and I, and I got a sense of, I guess, respect. And I was helping my friends out. And I I found that I had some competence with exercise from all the training that I'd done. And I, that's when it really bit me. You know, when I started to get into, I guess you could say, kind of like fitness and bodybuilding, like far before the time of Instagram. And it was cool, but I wanted to build muscle. And I think yeah. it, truly, I know this was part of my trauma response now. Right. Trying to build myself up yeah. to for, with a yeah. wound. But there was a lot of positives that came from that. Well, it's interesting. There's a couple interesting things that stand out here. One is the concept of young adults, your dad being a young adult at that time, you know, leveraging our health mm -hmm. for the sake of right building a family, building a business, building a, a career, you know, whatever it is, getting an education. And it's such a such a common thing. You know, we we take health for granted. And what I'm what I'm finding that's incredibly encouraging when I'm going to these conferences and speaking and things like that is that I have younger and younger people coming up to me asking me about, OK, how do I start a longevity trajectory now? Right. Mm -hmm. What what would be appropriate for me now? And there are some really helpful things that young people can do, like donating plasma is like a super healthy thing to do for young people and they get paid to do it. So, mm -hmm. you know, longevity, you need to sort of budget for longevity later in life. And there are certainly very good ways to pay for it pre-tax. We'll do some more podcasts on that. But that being said, if you're a younger person donating plasma and even older people can donate plasma and it's quite a healthy activity to kind of get rid of some of the old factors and reboot really? the stem cells and things like that. Yeah. Really? It's, it's actually super healthy. Yeah. So that's a cool thing. The other thing is that, you know, this, 
fork in the road that you faced, right? You're faced with a tremendous loss, tremendous sadness. Certainly there has to be some depression associated with that. Mm -hmm. And I know in my own life, when I've faced depression, one of the things that I've learned is that taking action is always a way out of that. Yeah. And so the fact that you were taking action physically and kind of throwing yourself into act activity like that, you know, we know that exercise itself will raise dopamine, right? And raise serotonin. And you get some of the endorphins when you push yourself so hard mm -hmm. that your lungs are burning and things like that, right? So you're starting to reset some of the neuro biochemistry there, uh, which is going to be incredibly helpful. And then you're starting to regain confidence. And what you're what you were trying to do is actually take back control For sure. of a situation that felt out of control, right? All of a sudden, it's like, who's next? Am I going to lose my mom next? How do I protect myself against this? How do I actually have some sense of confidence in my own health. And so I applaud you for going down that path because a lot of people don't go down that path. They end up depressed or with an eating disorder or uh, a substance abuse issue or something like that. But for you finding exercise, those dumbbells turned out to be really a symbol. You should probably hang those on the wall. Yeah, they, they really did become a symbol for me for sure. Yeah. And I, I think I feel very fortunate that I was in a, a right age for that to happen. Yeah. Like right, right around nine, 10, you know, I wasn't yes. old enough to have access to bad habits or, or weird outlets. I just had like right. the dumbbells right. and, and I had a sense of, of purpose yes. and I had some hormones that were starting to increase. So the perfect mm -hmm. storm led me into this, this beautiful passion mm -hmm. for exercise. When I went to university, I started to become a competitive bodybuilder. It was always a dream when I got into fitness and I did that for about 10 years and I took it pretty Perfect. far. I ended up winning a national championship as a junior bodybuilder, which was under 23 um, okay. And I learned a lot about taking the fitness aspect to a very high degree that then paired mm -hmm. with some of my psychology, nutrition studies, and then eventually naturopathic medicine, I was able to get a nice full picture of how to help people change. Yeah. So this is a really interesting intersection. So you're, you're taking your athleticism to a high level. You're also taking in the nutrition, but now you're adding in the naturopathic elements. That's mm -hmm. a really nice constellation of yeah. um, uh, what shall I say, education slash knowledge to leverage in this whole space. So what are some of the what are some of the key things that you learned for yourself in terms of both the exercise piece and nutrition piece? And what did you pull from the naturopathic place that actually helped you optimize? Well, I, I think even just the the legitimate learning journey I went on at every stage of my my psychological development of what I thought was true about health. I just see these distinct phases and in, in changes. Like when you're very steeped in fitness, you're thinking about things from a particular level. You're thinking about macronutrients. You're thinking about progressive training plans and, 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 and how to optimize recovery. And all that's very valid. And it worked for me when I was, you know, in my twenties, able to just charge mm -hmm. hard and do all that. And, but what ends up being relevant to what I teach people basically over 40, who are primarily our fit father and fit mother audience is quite different than anything I was doing with my bodybuilding style preparation. People are not mm -hmm. eating six small meals per day or separating cardio and strength training necessarily. It's more about like how to legitimately make it sustainable for busy parents, which is the exact thing my dad struggled with. He didn't need bodybuilding. Right. He needed a, a health routine, a sustainable nutrition plan some high intensity exercise sprinkled in and understanding a circadian rhythm in the immune system. Um, so mm -hmm. I think naturopathic medicine kind of softened and expanded my understanding of the fitness. I was glad that I got so deep, particularly in the nutrition side of things with the bodybuilding, like how to really mm -hmm. dial in and make a meal plan work. Like what does it take to meal prep? How do you actually stay on track with things? What actually feels sustainable versus what doesn't? Um, and I was mm -hmm. very steeped in like, I guess, like macros and fitness level thinking at that time. Naturopathic mm -hmm. medicine, honestly, it got me connected with natural law, like the concept that there are certain things in, in the body's relationship to the environment. And I'm talking about light, sunshine, circadian rhythm, et cetera, that, mm -hmm. that drive, that are these very high level factors that drive a lot of downstream signaling that we know leads to health. So it, yep. it kind of became a little more holistic. And I'd say even spiritual in a sense for me that the body lives well as a byproduct of this certain connection to these, to these natural laws, the laws of fasting and feeding, the laws of exertion, the laws of parasympathetic and sympathetic balance and stuff like this. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. We talk about that a lot on the podcast about biology is this economy of balance. It's not about how far can you push it in one direction or the other. It really does like to cycle through, you know, mm -hmm. being awake, being asleep, exercising, recovering, 
you know, having mTOR activated, you yes. know, for anabolic growth and then having AMPK activated yes. to, you know, rejuvenate and regenerate, so to speak, and activate longevity elements like autophagy and mitophagy and things like this. So, yeah, it's one thing in your early 20s or 20s when you're doing the bodybuilding, you've got a particular goal in mind. But but it's interesting how we all go through life and, you know, maybe you're out to win something. But ultimately, life is not about winning anything. It's about yeah. enjoying cycling through these different things so For that sure. it becomes fun, enjoyable and sustainable. So how do you coach your your fit parents here in terms of moms and dads? And how do you do it differently for each of them? What's that look like? Sure. I'd love to share about the process. I'd like to add a couple, two more tip, interesting tidbits from the, yeah. the life trajectory. When I was in university, I went to the University of Pennsylvania and I actually did some of the primary research on some of those GLP-1 agonists that are now big there. I was working in a neuroendocrine yeah. lab and we did some of that. And we we're also doing nice. some in, at, at Penn Med, I was doing some research on uh, mTOR AKT signaling as well. And we had some some yeah. knockout mice that were super jacked. Yeah. And it was it was fun to, to have actually some primary science and uh, that, that then came full circle into the stuff that I know is like really important to understand. Now, mm -hmm. when it comes to fit father, fit mother, and I guess what I saw when I was in naturopathic medical school too, was people were not failing due to lack of information. It was all like routines, behavioral psychology, how to create sustainable stuff. And, and part of that is helping people establish good nutrition habits, but a lot of it is mindset. A lot of it is relationship to health. A lot of it is the psychology of how many people struggling I think have this common logical fallacy like my dad did where they think that their health is a domain over here that is separate from the rest of their life. Like mm -hmm. I'll get to my health. Whereas like I have work right. and family over here. I don't, if someone says I don't have time to exercise, what that effectively means is that they believe that tending to the body is a separate category of things to balance than, you know, the rest of their life. And, and I help people kind of collapse that distinction early on mm -hmm. in the program, before we go to nutrition and exercise, we get into some deep psychology and start to make some new neuro associations around health. And the way of doing that practically is some deep journaling reflection and mindset work that ultimately culminates in people writing a mission statement. That's like a, a key initial stage of our program where people put pen to paper, they identify their core values. They actually get very conscious about how their health relates to all these values, like how your health relates to your ability to be mm -hmm. a good parent, to make money, to feel spiritually aligned, and start to make those neuro associations and also to bring pain in, like if, if you're not making changes here. So we get a lot of these psychological levers in place first because yeah. you need that framework to make change. Otherwise, you don't have enough fuel in the tank to blast off. Yeah, actually, that's that's exactly right. I love the idea of the mission statement and actually changing the psychology, because what I run into all the time is people are so busy that they feel like taking care of themselves. And it almost is beyond their health. It's almost the idea of taking care of themselves yeah. is, is part of the issue, right? Mm -hmm. They're so bent on, and this is true for mothers and for fathers yes. from different kind of angles, but they're so bent on taking care of the people around them that they keep leveraging themselves and they forget, or they're not dialed into realizing what, what's obvious is that if they don't take care of themselves, they're not going to be able to take care of these people. Yeah. But there's a, but there's a gate there that they yes. have to go through, right, yes. to understand that taking care of themselves is the central piece. Yes. And if they come into alignment around that, all of a sudden their ability to take care of everybody else is actually going to in, be enhanced. For sure. And yeah. even us understanding their concept of energy, energy, this this currency, this is a philosophical concept of energy, this currency that we can kind of deploy to accomplish things, to, to pursue our yeah. dreams, to be well with our families. And that like these health routines actually are additive, not subtractive. They can That's give right. you back time and energy as opposed to taking it. So there's a lot of psychological That's triggers right. and, and switches that are ideal to be flipped. And then the cool mm -hmm. thing too, is the process of starting to make that change, especially for people over 40 like requires getting people connected to the fundamentals of a sustainable, like I, we help with a schedule based eating plan. I'll get into that. And mm -hmm. honestly, just some daily movement. I think a lot of mm -hmm. people immediately have this idea over 40 that you need to go do high intensity exercise and add that in. And don't get me wrong. Exercise can be the fountain of youth. It is phenomenally important. Yet the truth is we've helped people lose over a hundred pounds doing daily walking, following good nutrition and getting their circadian rhythm on point. So not even sure. adding in more formal workouts. So there's an order of operations. And when you get your nutrition right and you have stable blood sugar, you know, you're not thinking yes. about what you need to eat. You gain so much back and, and you can create a lot of results. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's absolutely right. And there's a lot of psychology that goes into eating also. Yes. Uh, that has to be kind of unraveled 
uh, to figure out what is people's relationship to food. Yes. And I find also what's their relationship to alcohol. Yes. Because a lot of these become really ingrained in se sense of identity or cultural identity or religious identity or mm -hmm. their peer groups or whatever it is. And these things get kind of ingrained to where they start to take on this behavior as an identity, mm -hmm. right? It starts to become their identity. And so it's not just about, well, we're going to change what you eat. You have to kind of go in and do deeper work to your point. Yes. Kind of realigning them around what is my identity? What do I want it to be? You know, yes. If everything is made up, because quite honestly, everything is made up, then what it is it that we want to create? And and then getting them to actually think beyond what they've normalized is is a massive piece of it. So I think this is really important. I think one other thing I would add is that what we've figured out, too, is that in order to succeed here, it's so important to construct the environment to support the mission. 100%. And so without that, you can have all you can. Have, then the mindset's critical, right? This is number one in the book I just wrote. Right, the whole first section is really on life energy, and it mm -hmm. leads off with mindset, and yep. then goes into a bunch of psycho spiritual areas that are yep. critical, which I love. You know, that's not enough. You, willpower is not enough. You have to end up creating this environment to as effortlessly and as elegantly as possible create a space for people to actually accomplish what they're setting out to do. So uh, totally tracks with, totally good. tracks with my experience. And I, and I would say yeah. that a, a good psychological framework that I teach and really relate to is, is from a, a guy named Jonathan Haidt. He's a psych, clinical psychologist who has this idea of all change is, is represented in the idea of uh, the elephant, the rider in the path. And have you, are you familiar with this? No. Okay. Then, then allow me to have one minute because I think it's going to highlight exactly what you shared is, yeah. is imagine that we have a giant elephant and there's a rider, a man riding on top of the elephant and they're walking down a path. They have a goal to get to a particular destination. This is representative of the different aspects of, of our psychology. The path is the environment. If we want to get somewhere, it's ideal if there's not trees in the, in the way and it's like it's well-groomed and it's easy to walk. So that's changing our environment. It's going to be key. You don't need to have as much effort or willpower. The elephant right. is our deep emotional aspect of our brain. These are, you know, these are, these are our deep unconscious drives. These are our traumas, our impressions. These are the fact that we use food um, and alcohol as stress and pressure release valves. This is like the emotional aspect of, of our decision making that's oftentimes unconscious. And then mm -hmm. the writer is the conscious part. He's the guy who's got the plan, but he's small. Like, yeah, you can have yeah. a concept that you're going to follow some kind of keto laid out diet, but if emotionally you're not aligned, you're not moving the elephant at all. And real change happens when the rider has clear direction. He's got a plan. It's sustainable. Mm -hmm. The elephant is aligned. That's the deep emotional work and the path is paved. And so we need to get all these things kind of in the right direction. And when you have yeah. those factors going, you can make mm -hmm. sustainable change. Oftentimes when people fail, it's one of those is off. They lack That's clarity correct. with the rider. The elephant's unmotivated or the path is too bumpy. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's a really uh, concise way to describe it. Yeah. The, and, and I think all those have to be in, in place. I think what I see most frequently is that people get the rider to want something, to want to go down the path, but the path is not cleared. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no intent or work put into actually creating the environment. Yes. And then, and then there's really is this deep psychological work where I think anybody that's really interested in optimizing your longevity has to be asking this question, how do I get rid of this baggage that I'm carrying, right? How do I actually stop living in reaction to the traumas that have occurred yes. to me? How do I become my unencumbered self where I can step forward relationally, spiritually, emotionally into just the joy of being alive, right? Yes. And not feel like you've got all this stuff that you're carrying around. And I think when you can when you can do that, it it transforms you from being able to get healthy into actually living young, what I call living young for a yeah. lifetime. Right. Yeah. That, so yeah. I, I totally agree. And I and I think that is a process that's actually created actively, naturally in the dojo of your life. And and what I mean by that is in a program where people join Fit Father, Fit Mother, there's the initial psychological work, which is a really good impetus. It's like a good initial mm -hmm. spurt, but ultimately yeah. it's showing up to the, to the next 30 days, day by day, getting into the lab, experimenting mm -hmm. and, and doing the actual actions that really does the rewiring and the new neuro associations. And mm -hmm. this is where I feel like nutrition and circadian rhythm are like the two great hooks that we have on a daily basis to get us going. And I think nutrition in particular, because it's a place where people are going to eat anyways, 
they can start to implement like new healthy framework on top of it. It gives them like a hook every day to like latch on to, mm-hmm. to begin to practice and, and, and see results. And it's probably also the greatest gains for someone in terms of energy changes, you know, reducing inflammation, you know, you can make so many gains yeah. for people in nutrition. So like when you start to do that, people can start to get in that confidence, competence loop, start to feel better. Intrinsic motivation kicks in. So we really deeply focus on nutrition and also tell our program members, primarily people who want to lose weight. Hey, this is probably 75% of the game right here, you know? So like, let's really get into this. That's right. No, that's right. It's uh, nutrition. If you're looking to optimize weight, nutrition is 75, even 80% of it. And then mm-hmm. the other 20, 25% is probably exercise and, yep. and the other elements around sleep and uh, circadian rhythm and stress management and things like that. So, yeah, that's interesting. So, so you went from graduating from Penn, you got these degrees, you're focused on all this. And then what was your path to starting this, this program? Well, I, you know, and this is actually kind of comes back to a little bit of my child experience as, I, as I'm healing when I'm, when I'm quite young, maybe I'm in my teens now from my dad's passing with my mom, you know, she's trying to pull her life together and she has all these like Tony Robbins motivational audio tapes in the background. So I had a, the benefit of getting, you know, some, some pretty solid advice, mm-hmm. you know, put into my ear from a young age. And what I found striking is I, I, I didn't just love getting positive, affirming messages and, and hopeful messages. I also was like, man, this guy's got a really cool life. He's figured out some stuff and he gets to help people with it. So in the back mm-hmm. of my mind, I always had an idea that, you know, I want to teach and share some things that I knew. And sp- mm-hmm. specifically when I became, you know, very competent as a young bodybuilder and I got a lot of press traveling around the country, doing a lot of things like this, I'm like, I got a lot of things to share. So in medical school, I started my first couple of websites and man, it's a journey, not just like learning health and medicine, but also learning how to like share this stuff with, right. you know, web design. Yeah tech pages like marketing and all this so i've spent around 10 years kind of going into learning how to build and share and write blogs youtube channels and funny enough i had some great mentors someone told me maybe around 15 years ago like no one had really written good articles for the keywords like weight loss for men over 40 over 50 so i wrote those original articles and you know now mm-hmm. they have millions of views and and i'll say like honestly you know I'm, I'm proud to share this like we've since the beginning of these companies we've had a between fit father and fit mother, close to a hundred thousand people go through our programs in over a hundred countries. So mm-hmm. it's, it's been nice. really amazing. And, and it's also yeah. helped me refine with this many data points and this many people coming through, like what actually works for the majority of people. And, and so that's uh yeah, I think that's been that. Yeah. No, that's awesome. This episode of the Gladden Longevity podcast is brought to you by H2 Molecular Hydrogen in the Gladden Longevity store. Yeah. Steve, you've heard us talk about this numerous times on the podcast in terms of the benefits of of H2 um, and hydrogen water. We love it. You know, it's really the best way to balance your entire redox system. So it really protects you from free radical damage. I take it every time I get on a flight to protect me from radiation damage when I'm flying. And I use it to rejuvenate my brain in the afternoon. You know, there's really two kinds of exercise. There's physical exercise and taking H2 before or after that works great, but also there's mental exercise. And I find that the H2 will bring your brain back when you're tired in the afternoon. So Mm. I think it's like the perfect thing for longevity and for performance, quite honestly. And I talked to you about this, that I found dropping one or two tablets in a glass of water right before bed. I've seen an overall bump in my deep sleep when I do so. And yeah. Yeah. So if you click on the store tab, when you visit gladdenlongevityshop.com and use the promo code podcast 10, you'll get 10% off your order. And this code isn't only good for our H2 product, but it's also good for all the supplements we carry. So podcast 10 at the gladden longevity shop.com. Yeah. One of the other things that I, I use it for routinely is when I'm about to go on a mountain bike ride. And I will say this, that with, if I go on a long mountain bike ride, I will take one prior, I'll take one during, and I'll take one after. And some of the iron men that we've worked with have said that when they're doing an iron man, they'll take it three or four times throughout the race. And yeah. they're, their, yeah, their comment is that it's like taking out the old battery and putting in a new one. It really rejuvenates your body's ability to perform uh, when you're doing more extended athletic activity. So think about that too. You know, if you want to go do a longer hike or whatever else, take it with you. So gladdenlongevityshop.com, enter podcast 10 for 10% off your order. H2 molecular hydrogen. 
It's low-hanging fruit on your quest to make 100 to new 30. So what's your trajectory now? What is it? What's next for you? What are you looking to do? What are your next steps? Well, in terms of my, my vision is it's not going to be lost in anyone here listening to this, that we have both the opportunity today to be the healthiest and most optimized as possible, but also perhaps one of the sickest cultures that we've currently seen. If you just look at like mm -hmm. the cardio metabolic condition of most middle-aged yeah. adults and kids, like it's freaking rough out there. Like we need all of us, all hands on deck to be, to be helping people and sharing these messages. And I think that there's a really powerful way that the concept of this family centric values based health for like the average American is landing for people with fit father, fit mother. My trajectory mm -hmm. is I want a million customers. I want a million people to be in community. I want to get people on these sustainable, simple nutrition plans. The kinds of exercise we do, I call metabolic resistance training. It's like probably great exercise for longevity, strength, cardio, functional movement, very time efficient a couple times a week. I want to get this like steep deeply into people's cultures. And honestly, Jeff, give them hope because many people have tried all these different complicated diets and failed. I want them to have a community yeah. where they can have a slightly deeper connection to health. Like it's not fit man project, fit woman project. It's father and mother. I'm helping connect to core values and making it family centric. And then there's a trick done effect with kids. I see it all the time. So I want to really reach more families, particularly in Western countries is where we mostly focus. And uh, I honestly, I'm just getting started in my career here. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's awesome. So do you do anything with, you know, the way you've got it broken out is you've got fit mothers on one hand yeah. and fit mothers on the other. Yeah. But it sounds like you're also talking about fit families. Yeah. And so, right. And so is there an element where you do have a family program where you do bring the kids into it and the mother and father simultaneously and that sort of thing? Or For sure. I mean, there's and there's many people who do it as a family, as couples join fit father, fit mother. I, I, what I found, honestly, and I, I don't know if this is just from my early experiences of having gone to an all boys school and being in a fraternity in college and times, but there's sometimes power in gender specific groups in these communities mm -hmm. that seem to have a certain amount of safety in them. And so yeah. the fit father and fit mother communities being separate, we've found it is like massively beneficial because people can become very intimate with mm -hmm. strangers, if you will, people they don't know, but mm -hmm. like you're all on the same values and there's a same yeah. shared wavelength there. Um, yeah. and, and, and the kids get incorporated in every step of the journey. I mean, food is largely one of these things that unites families, whether the kids are exercising with their parents, like they're typically right. sharing dinner. So we help we're really take control of the nutrition aspect of, of the household and, and many fit fathers and fit mothers do it together. And I'll say this in terms of environment for a, a, a dad or a mom getting healthy, your spouse is probably one of the biggest factors in your environment, right? And you're yeah. co-creating this home. So Ultimately, the people who succeed long term, like there's a culture shift that happens in the home. That's right. Yeah. If you if you're trying to do this on your own and you've got an antagonistic, yeah. you know, spouse or significant other or even if the kids are super antagonistic, it makes it that it makes it that much tougher. So I was just thinking that you've got the fit mothers and the fit fathers. It seems like there could be uh, some activity to bridge those together. And I realize people are doing it on their own. And I get the safety of, yeah. you know, women talking with women and men talking with men. I think there's wisdom in that for sure. I'm just wondering, have you thought about expanding this into other institutions besides the family? Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is the kind of like, well, at least in terms of like the fact that we are giving the most high impact, sustainable tips when it comes to nutrition and exercise that works for busy professionals. I mean, certainly mm -hmm. we've thought about partnering with certain companies and, and getting this into the workforce. Like, yeah, I mean, we got some plans for sure. And, and what we're doing yeah. right now, now that we're kind of talking from like a business community standpoint is, is getting all of our current stuff, which is a combination of like different Facebook groups and websites and, and backend membership areas into one cohesive platform that we're building right now. So Fit father, mm -hmm. fit mother is all in the, the palm of your hand in an app and in a community. And we actually are, are leaning into as everything gets more digital into a lot more in-person meetups too. you know, like galvanizing our community in terms of local meetups. We run retreats, uh, experiences, service trips. And and I, I just think that the blessing of health and certainly you're a champion for this, Jeff, is that you get to do more things. You get to have more impact. You need to live on more purpose. And so phase one of your health journey is getting yourself into a state of like well-being. 
And then phase two is using that energy for great purpose to help like to serve yeah. and, and express fully, which typically is in the direction of goodness. So there's a dimension yeah. of like taking this army of people who are now fit fathers, fit mothers connected and helping them just like do more good and be the light. And now we're talking about like generative multiplicative math. And now we're talking about goodness that becomes a little more exponential. And that's what I'm really interested in beyond just the strictly health and fitness is creating an army of healthy, good people doing more good. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's perfect. When I gave this talk at Radfest, one of my final slides was basically showing a slide, last couple slides, actually. One is that, you know, aging itself, itself is exponential decline. It's not linear, even though yeah. we conceive of it as linear, we perceive it as linear. It's actually not, right? Mm -hmm. So it's exponential. And yet our ability to impact the world also goes up exponentially every decade, yeah. right? Every decade we have more exponential financial ability to, to impact the world. So, and there's more opportunity for us as well. So opportunity and impact both go up exponentially. And when the lines cross, then, you know, the exponential opportunity and impact begins to, to go down. Yeah. So the last slide that I show is that, okay, well, what if you stay 30 for the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. What if you make hundred, the new 30, what if you, what yeah. if you live at 30 and then you draw that line of exponential increase in opportunity yeah. and impact, right? It, the, the return on investment, the point is that the return on investment is a thousandfold what you put into it because of staying young and not having to deal with decline and loss of energy and sickness and disease and all this other stuff. The energy you put into what you're talking about, what we do, what we're all in this space to do is really beyond what people can even imagine because nobody's actually even lived this life yet, right? Yes. Everybody's gotten old. And so if you really go after aging itself, which is another, we'll call it tack on to health, if you will. Mm -hmm. But if you stay young for the rest of your life, we have the opportunity to live into a space that nobody ever has. And it's, mm -hmm. it's beyond your wildest imagination, how much impact you can have, how centered you can be, how spiritually aligned, yes. how psychologically replete, right? So it's uh, it's such an exciting future. I get super excited about sharing that with people. Well, I, I'd love to give, honestly, just a, a really a personal reflection on my relationship with you because I've seen you speak in person before. I literally, I have so much respect for you because I think, because I see you on that curve. Like you have, yeah. you have the wisdom of life experience paired mm -hmm. with health in a decade where everyone else is going down and you're going up. That's like, right. so, so, so that's what actually I think creates a certain that's amount right. of magnetism around you that many people are drawn to. Certainly the people listening to this podcast and I'll also throw sure. up my hand as well in that vote. So sure. we appreciate you leading by example. And I'd love to be like you when I grow up too. And I think I have the benefit too, of, of having started like even yeah. deep in this journey a couple decades earlier. Right. So right. when that's I'm in right. my sixth, seventh decade of life, holy crap, right. it's going to be amazing. Right. It's going to be ridiculously cool. Yeah, no, I'm excited about that. I'm very excited about that. It is interesting. I will tell you that even this year, the opportunity and the impact for Glide and Longevity is growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. And it's very cool because if I get together with my high school class or people from college, it's a completely, totally, yeah, totally must be different surreal. Trajectory. It's surreal. It's actually surreal. I literally feel like I'm 30. And it's like, oh my gosh, the world is now finally opening up in such a massive way. I can't wait to live into it. It's, it's, yeah. it's a completely different reality. And I, this is what I really want people to capture that are listening to this. What we're talking about is not just getting healthy so you can kind of enjoy life and be good. It's actually creating a new future that is better than you can even imagine. Yeah. And, and I'll add the impact, the pass down impact of just you being doing that in the context of a family structure can have generational impacts and shifts as well 100%. that, and, and right. Cause I mean, I'm a naturopath. You're talking to a guy who believes in preventative medicine here. Right. And I mean, like right. it's a yeah. lot easier to do good stuff from day one and not have to unwind a bunch of baggage. And right now, if we can get parents healthy at a certain time and they can create a new culture, we yeah. can have a generation of kids. that's on a different trajectory. Yeah, no, totally. It changes everything for, I mean, it's, it's really, I think, it's kind of hopeful for society. It's hopeful for the world, because if you have a group of people that are on this different trajectory from a younger age at an older age, it changes the narrative around everything else. Yeah. And that's very exciting. So, and I'll say one more thing too. I think like, 
is I do not, I no longer, I think from some spiritual awakenings I've had, I don't view life through a competitive lens. Like this is a this right. is massive competition because it's just not true. It's a, it's collaborative, expansive. There's, there's a greater pie that we can keep on building. That yep. said, getting healthier, especially and having healthier kids makes, makes you smarter, more stress resilient, more emotionally regulated and anything you do, you're going to thrive. And I think the gap between young people who are on these right routines, proper screening rhythm, anti-inflammatory foods, good exercise, loving family connections, the gap is going to be massive. I, I know I got smarter substantially mm -hmm. from my teens to my twenties than I wouldn't have if, if, uh, if I hadn't been so deep into these routines. So it's like, that's Man, right. you want to thrive? Like, get that soil right. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. No, it's super exciting stuff. So, I, I really love the trajectory that you're on. I applaud what you've done, and I, I really applaud the way you've taken, you know, your early life experience and transformed it into not only changing your own life, but now changing the lives of many other people. I appreciate so, that. I think we're here of yeah. service, and you know, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's amazing how when I think of the psychological <laughs> frameworks I was operating in healing myself after my dad passed, getting very attached to building my body up in my twenties and accomplishing school and getting things done and performing high. And now mm -hmm. I've transitioned to this next phase of fatherhood and service, which is like such a mm -hmm. different and deeper and beautiful energy. And I, and I know too, having the humility of feeling myself in much different paradigms that there's going to be more shifts even past this, but I'm already, I'm in a, I'm in a much deeper level now. And, and it's, and I'm motivated by such deeper factors and that it's goodness. And then also that's why I want to stay well too. Like my sure. motivation is no longer for my own physical looking a certain way. I look right. fantastic with my shirt off, but I don't give a shit. I mean, I, I do. It's just a byproduct of like, you right. know, doing this good lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. You know, I will say that, you know, when you have kids and I've got, I've got kids, you've got, sounds like you've got at least one kid. We'll find out in a second, but What's interesting is the enjoyment that your children have of you when you can still go mountain bike with them or snowboard with them yeah. or, you know, do whatever you want to do with them. Yeah. And they see all of their all of their friends, peers, parents yeah. who are not able to do that. It starts to dawn on them. Hey, you know what? I think I want to have a different trajectory here, yeah. too. Right. So this whole leading by example kind of thing, and then the joy that comes through the family bi-directionally, right? We get to enjoy them. They get to enjoy us. Yeah. It's, it's let, cool. let alone, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if you're at the stage yet of becoming a grandfather. I mean, when you're going to be a grandpa yeah. and you're, you're going to be skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking with your grandkids, like yeah. that's, that's that nuts was. because that's really that cage. Like grandpa's old and he's stronger than me. Like that right. really that impresses you. And I think exactly. it's good for people in their twenties who have a lot of vitality and not necessarily the best habits who can rely on just general, the vitality right. of youth to witness right. being outstripped and outpaced by That's right. good living. It's, yeah. it's humbling and good for young people in a vital well, stage of their lives. Yeah, I agree. My oldest grandchild is 12 right now. So. Okay. So you're definitely in the game. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have a toddler, so I'm in the beginning of this game here. Okay. So okay. yeah. Good. So how many, you have one toddler? Yeah, one toddler. Little boy, little girl? Little girl. And something, okay. that, yeah, a dad with a girl, man, I, I gotta tell you, it's something. I, I And I also, right. you know, I, I don't know what the vision will hold with what activity she's going to really get into. But man, I want to be able to do somersaults and backflips with her to run around, to get whatever right. she's into. Like, And I know now it's funny, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in this new physical journey of exploration of her interests with her. And I'm yeah. going to get into a whole bunch of different things. I might be ribbon dancing in 10 years. Who knows, Jeff? No, that's the beauty of it is, is, um, is getting outside of yourself. Like one of my granddaughters who's just turned 10 in July, I was visiting and um, she wanted to do a ropes course. Mm -hmm. So we spent the afternoon doing this ropes course, you know, climbing all this stuff, jumping around, doing all these things, swinging off stuff and slamming into things. I don't know, zip lines and whatever else. It was super fun. But it was interesting because, you know, they're scrambling around. I'm scrambling around. And yet her parents are not scrambling around quite as quickly. Yeah, and so, sure. right? so it's really kind of it's really kind of interesting. But it's um, so there's so much joy in living to be had when you have your health that mm -hmm. this is what I wish for everybody that you yeah. can just step into that. Right. So, yep. And the one thing I'll share is I'm sure you have a, a wrap up is the connection between the health of the mind and the health of the body is inextricable. It's top down, it's bottom up. Like yep. when you pair the combination of a healthy, vital body 
good circulatory health, good blood sugar regulation, healthy mitochondria, good exercise capacity. And then what happens with the mind where the mind also becomes peaceful, good, spiritually aligned, man, your, your, everything starts to really flower and open up. Like that's That's the true expression of the human. And I'm sure that's covered in many deep ways in your book, just from the phrase life force. It's the real expression on all these different dimensions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've had this epiphany recently about what does it mean to become fully human? Mm -hmm. And Mm. I think that, you know, I've had preconceptions in the past about being fully human is kind of embracing all of the, all of the angst and the pain and struggling with all these things. And now I've really moved beyond that into, I think to be fully human is really to be sort of God's expression of a spiritual being, right? And an unencumbered spiritual being and just the pure joy of that. It's almost like back to the Garden of Eden. It's almost like heaven on earth, right? Yeah, so to be fully that, human yeah. is almost to be like in the Garden of Eden as opposed to out of the Garden of Eden trying to struggle with all this stuff. That's not really fully human. That's an aberration of humanity, if you will. To be fully human is to go back to the garden, yeah. right? And live in that bliss. And so that that's- That's beautifully said. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Yeah, I can see you do. So that's cool. So tell me a little bit about your spiritual journey. It sounds like you've done some things to, in that whole space. Hundred percent. Maybe some yeah. non psychedelics. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah. So it all kind of was a catalyst a little bit uh, when I was in my final year of medical school. I took a, a skiing trip to Durango, Colorado, and I've been skiing okay. since I was a young young man, and I'm a very good right. skier. And uh, that day I was really feeling myself as a very good skier. And I had the strongest intuition that I needed to slow down and chill out that day. And uh, Mm -hmm. I almost had, I almost had a a bad accident early in the day where I was like going too fast and kind of flew off into a mogul patch and I caught my hamstring a little bit. I'm like, man, that could have been terrible, but I kept on pressing and I was skiing from ego. Um, And what I was actually doing was kind of jumping off this small head wall going about 30, 40 miles per hour. And I do it once. And the second time I go to do it, my skis blow off. And I ended up tumbling and slamming into a tree at about 35 miles per hour. I shatter my right femur, break my arm, could have Mm -hmm. died instantly. And it it kind of kicked off such a tremendous life-changing injury (laughs) that it shook me to my core. uh, It made me, you know, really destabilize this this egoic relationship I had with my body. I was in, underwent six surgeries, including a leg lengthening surgery um, over the course of six years. A tremendous amount of pain but also a tremendous opportunity to turn inward into meditation, into actively directing my life force for healing into forgiveness. Uh, psychedelics were a part of the, that phase of time and, and then deep meditation. And it's funny because it initially kind of like my bodybuilding pursuits where it was about like really achieving a certain dimension of perfection in the physical domain. I, I, I sought the spirituality to, to create a desired outcome or even to achieve a certain state of mind that many people could describe as enlightenment. And then in mm. the twists and turns of all of this, it kind of came into this beautiful humility of, of surrender and love and God and a lot of the stuff that you've talked about and uh, yeah. reconnected in some sense to my Christian roots. Um, and it's just been very full circle. Um, but mm. spirituality has become like the, the great domain of the expression of my life. So my, I, I maintain my health because right. it's spiritually aligned, not the other way around. And uh, I, yeah. it, it took some pain for me to figure that out. But I've been able to catalyze pain into uh, a lot of lessons. And, and I, that's kind of been my path. Yeah, no, that's that's beautifully said. I think a lot of us go through the journey. We're kind of exposed to quote unquote spirituality when we're young. Yeah, but it's really more like we're exposed to religion, which yes. is really more like dogma, For which sure. is really like people talking about things that are supposed to be spiritual, but they're not really spiritual because mm-hmm. there's no spirituality in it. Yeah, and then you kind of go through life, and if you're drawn to it, you're kind of drawn back into okay, no, I do want to feel this greater sense of connection, this greater sense of well being, this greater sense of purpose, sure. right? And so finding our ways back into that, I think also feeds back into health yeah. dramatically because stress levels go way down. Sure. You know, right. They just go, when you yeah. feel safe, when you feel loved, when you feel a sense of purpose, when you, you know, all these things, all of a sudden it's like, wow, no, it's good. Everything's good. But, but oh, yeah, things are happening, but it, it's not impacting me. It's, You're so true. Everything. That right? became so evident to me when I began to meditate and also read a lot of like, great spiritual texts from many different traditions about like, I'm like, holy crap. Like this is about main, like you, the people who live a long time have a parasympathetic dominance 99% of the time. They can sympathetically activate to the best of them, but they are living parasympathetic, which means their breathing is slower. 
their heart rate is slower. Their physiology is in this perfect rest and abundance. The mitochondria are active or working perfectly. And it's like right. the system is just in this, uh, this beautiful energetic suspended animation. And the, it's like the difference between a tortoise and a mouse. A tortoise will live for a hundred years. A mouse will live for a year. It's freaked yeah, out about true. dying all the time, right? Two years, right? You know, one to yeah. two years. So I, yeah. I, it's about maintaining that parasympathetic uh, state. And obviously the mental, emotional, spiritual practices are essential with that. It's like they're inseparable. It's just like the parasympathetic is the manifestation of the more spiritual state. And we can also measure this in brain waves as well, like the alpha waves and the deeper brain wave states as well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, we did a podcast with Patrick Porter. Uh, I don't know if you know, Patrick, he's a mm -hmm. developer of a device called brain tap. Yeah. Yeah. Of course I know brain tap. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that's a very cool device. I've been playing with it quite a bit free here recently. If people are listening and they want to get one, I think they'd get one on our, with a discount code, if I'm not mistaken, Steve knows these things. I don't know these things, but, but anyway, it's a very cool device because you can dial in the brain waves that you're after. Yeah. So you can put yourself in gamma and go into a flow state while you're cool. answering emails, or you can put yourself in alpha and go into a meditative state. You can go into theta, which is kind of like a really deep relaxation. Yeah. I really love theta. Me too. And then you can go to delta and you can do this thing called SMR which is very cool. You wake up and put on SMR and you can pick the other frequencies that we, you want, right? So you can put in other frequencies that are aligned with certain musical tones. Mm -hmm. And the SMR kind of wakes your brain up, but it also works incredibly well with things like balance training. So you can, like today I was running SMR and I was on the endo board and the extreme balance board with my eyes closed doing different things. And it's kind of like, because really when you think yeah. about it, it's all about how do you dial in your nervous, your nervous system for, for sure. You know, to have as much Proprioception is one of them with frequency. I mean, that's 100. neuroplasticity physically in like a nutshell right there, let alone exactly. if you add other like lion's mane, niacin, <laughs> lotos, right. psilocybin, your brain is that's probably right. like an 18 year old right now. <laughs> exactly. No, that's exactly the point. Yeah. When you get, when you get all that stuff going, you know, if you're optimizing your brain health, you know, then, you know, the MRI, scans that people get when they're older look their brain that shows some white matter attrition mm -hmm. so to speak you can yeah. regrow the brain for sure you know when you're doing these kinds of things so if you're going to be 30 and you're listening to this you know think about these things as hacks to hack your way back to actually being 30 and having a nervous system that has yeah. all the flexibility and neuroplasticity of a yep. 30 year old but has all the wisdom and calmness so the ultimate goal is kind of a 30 year old body with a 300 year old mind well said that's yeah. so beautifully said. And I think too, for people who struggle with meditation, what you just described as those physical practices are giving you a lot of benefits. And I also love to know the research that people who are in their fifties who meditate have healthier brains often than people who are in their twenties and thirties, and you can grow That's white right. matter and gray matter. It's like, it's crazy how cool the changes yeah. that happen. Yeah. Super cool. Well, Steve, as you've, uh, as you've been listening in on all this, any thoughts come to mind? Any questions you have? Well, Anthony, my question for you is how practically you, you talked about family fit mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how practically you're doing this with your toddler right from the get go. Yeah. I mean, a toddler is the definition of a, a somewhat constantly fast changing, disruptive time uh, with oh. circadian rhythms and, and food expression. I think right now it's, it's like she is watching me exercise and be active. We're going on walks like crazy. I am getting her outside in a love of nature as like a yep. baseline of just what we do and connecting her with the natural cycles. I really protect her circadian rhythm. She's got baby blue blockers and helping her get in trained with the light because I believe that's a high level signal that's going to help. And then, and then honestly, already mm -hmm. identifying, you know, her food sensitivities and getting her to eat the things that are going to be optimal for her from a young age. So that mm -hmm. becomes like the new normal. She's a little, and, and also leaning into the, all the ways that she loves loves to move. She's really into stairs. We spend 30 okay. minutes going up and down the stairs and like, and I find the joy <laughs> and the spirituality in that. You know what I mean? I'm working on like, I had the, I had the leg surgeries. I'm working on my glute meat as I'm stepping up the stairs with her and stuff. So yeah, incorporating yeah. her and also just modeling the behaviors and making this be the normal for her. I, I keep her, I know we don't necessarily go on, I go down this rabbit hole, but I keep her in a low EMF environment, at least non-native EMF is, is, is low. I believe yeah. that's important. And food inputs are very good. Cool. Very cool. Well, Anthony, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I love the conversation. Loved all the topics that we floated into here. So thanks really to you both. Stuff.